Welcome to the Center for Investment Excellence, a production of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. The Center for Investment Excellence is an audio podcast that provides educational insights across asset classes and investment themes. Today's episode is on unpacking the opportunity in developed market equities. I'm David Lebowitz, global market strategist in our multi-asset solutions business and host of the Center for Investment Excellence. With me today is Tim Woodhouse, portfolio manager in the International Equity Group. Welcome to the Center for Investment Excellence. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to our conversation today, and and obviously we're going to be focused on you know what's going on in in markets outside of the U.S. and and any potential opportunity. China has been under pressure, PMI kind of teetering around that key 50 level. Europe, obviously, the PMIs have moved down below 50, signaling fairly weak growth. The UK, you know, stuck in stagflation, arguably the worst case scenario uh, if you're an economy, but an even worse case scenario if you're a central banker. But you know, when you when you talk to other investors, there's still an an, an element of enthusiasm and excitement about markets outside of the U.S. And you know, my first question to you would be: Let's just start with the twenty thousand foot view. Um, over the past decade plus, developed markets outside of the United States have lagged the U.S. equity market horribly, right? And a lot of people have left international for dead. They're leaning heavily into the U.S. The U.S., I'm not saying, is is without its own problems, but again, looking relatively good, particularly from a growth perspective. So can you talk a little bit about, in this environment, the macro case for developed markets outside of the U.S.? Valuations are, are an important part of this this whole debate. Let's Let's think about what's changed over the past decade, where, as you said, the outperformance has been monumental. We had a fantastic tailwind for valuations from falling rates. And I think most people, myself included, would say that that's unlikely to to continue, or certainly won't be repeated in the same way. Nearly half of US returns over the past decade came from a valuation tailwind. They came from a re-rating. That number is not as high outside the US. And if you don't think you have that tailwind going forwards, I think it really does come back to, to growth and where expectations are and how that's priced in. Let's think for a second about the highest growth companies, where, of course, the U.S. is innovating better than anybody else. There is no denying that. You look at the what's happening in Silicon Valley. You look at the companies that are listed in recent years. Absolutely, there is faster growth here. You look at how they're being valued, though. You're still seeing a significant P premium for each point of revenue growth compared to the last 40 years. And when you think about where yields are today, that seems even more out of step with, with where it should be. So that high valuation starting point, I think you, you do have to, to consider. Now, of course, Europe's in a tougher economic situation, of course. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that the mismatch with the transmission mechanism for, for interest rate rises is, is really starting to have an impact. In, in the US, when I bought my apartment in 2021, I've locked in a 30-year mortgage rate at 275. And now I'm getting 5% plus on my, my cash. In the UK, the average mortgage has been a five-year mortgage. Right. So we're rolling through that now, and you can see the pain that's being felt in the UK, but it's starting to roll across Europe and the rest of the world. It does mean, though, that expectations are incredibly low. So I think valuations has to be an important part of why, actually, for the first time in, in probably a decade of, of doing this job, I think this might now be the moment where you start to see the balance shift in favor of international. And it's it's really interesting that you, that you hone in on valuation, because one of the things that we've been spending quite a bit of time talking about is you, you look at where valuations are today, you think about the risks that may or may not exist on the horizon, right? You know, kind of soft landing, hard landing, we can debate that <clears throat> until we're purple in, in the face. The question is what's been priced in, right? And it feels to me, and I think that you would agree, something very different and arguably more pessimistic has been priced into markets outside of the US. And this comes at a really interesting time. Because I would argue that from more of a, a fundamental perspective, the tide is beginning to turn, particularly in places like Europe. You know, you've basically seen fiscal austerity get thrown to the wind. Uh, the sector mix, from a market perspective, is very different today than it was prior to the financial crisis, when obviously European markets were primarily dominated by by banks. Um, and you know, frankly, I think that higher interest rates having a cost of capital means that it's not necessarily just 
a U.S. story, right? There are good companies elsewhere, which may be viewed differently now that there's actually differentiation between winners and losers. And so talk to me a little bit about Europe and, and the opportunity set there. Well, that, that sector composition point is a great place to start. Because if you look back at the start of 2008, the top three sectors in the MSI Europe were energy and mining, 19%, banks at 15%, and telecoms at, at 7%. You look today, 14% is pharma and biotech, 12% is cap goods, and 8% is food and beverage. So within all of those sectors, I would argue they are higher ROE businesses, more stable businesses. And I think that's what makes the fact that Europe's trading at really close to all-time low PEs versus the rest of the world particularly interesting, because it is a structurally better market. That's true even if you look out at longer-term PEs. And the reason that's important is when you look at our long-term growth forecast for Europe versus the US, we're forecasting 9.2% long-term earnings growth for the US and 55 for Europe. So going further out with your PEs does matter when you're trying to measure what the true valuation is. Even on long-term PEs, Europe looks very, very cheap today. And I think that, that gives us some comfort that, that overweights to the, uh, to the region are actually going to be quite beneficial. Bridgewater, interestingly, last week came out with a, a piece that highlighted that even if European earnings fell modestly for the next decade, investors would still earn a break-even equity risk premium. So essentially, a normal compensation for taking equity risk. So given we do forecast 5.5% earnings growth, and I think that there's there's another angle to that story as well, which is you know globalization, deglobalization, onshoring, however however you want to phrase it. Countries are going to trade with their friends more going forward, and there are a lot of <clears throat> very, very, very solid businesses in places like Europe that are now setting up operations here in the United States. And so, you know, arguably there's there's a, a, an extension of the story that you were talking about where, you know, some of these businesses are, are arguably increasing their exposure to an economy with a trend growth rate, which is above that of what we see uh, in the Eurozone and, and the UK. And that's an important point because I think people do still perceive Europe as being European exposure and, and right. very cyclical. And look, I said the largest sector in Europe is pharma and biotech. They don't make their money in, in Europe. They make their money in, in the US. And we all know the reasons for that. And I th But I think that's particularly important when you think about the stability of the returns that you can make in Europe. You look at the high quality nature of some of the companies that we've been, been buying, whether it's an ASML or an LVMH, who clearly dominate their particular sector. But even you look at a, a Volvo within trucks, or you look at a Kingspan within insulation, these are champions of their particular right. industries, which happen to be listed in Europe, which happens to mean you can get them at a better valuation right now. But it doesn't change the high quality nature of the cash flow generation. We're in an environment where rates may go down, but they're not going to go back to zero. And so we need to be sensitive to the prices we're paying today, given that structurally it looks like we're going to be operating and investing in a slightly different uh, type of interest rate environment. And Speaking of interest rates, I want to move on to you know what many would consider to be the uh, the elephant in the room. So, Japan. You know, you and I have known each other for more than a decade. We've seen plenty of of glimmers of light from the Japanese economy, the Japanese markets, and it feels like, at least in in my experience, that each time it kind of proves to be a bit of a false dawn. But you look at what's going on in Japan today, and and things are. You know, I'm going to say different, which I know is a dangerous word in, in our business. But, you know, it's in the midst of a post-COVID rebound, right, much earlier on in that recovery than the rest of the world and particularly the developed markets. Um, you're seeing higher interest rates, more inflation, more wage growth. You know, we, we hear that corporate governance is coming into focus and, and there's going to be more attention paid to making sure that shareholders are, are compensated for, for their equity ownership. And so it feels like structurally things are, are moving in the right direction in a way that hasn't necessarily been the case in the past, where it's, oh, buy it because it's cheap, or, oh, buy it because they're not dealing with the same problems as the rest of the world. It seems like there's actually a positive fundamental story that's beginning to take hold there. So talk to me about Japan. I mean, is this another head fake? Is it another false dawn? Or, or is it actually an emerging structural opportunity? Look, I think there are there are elements of good things going on in Japan, but there's, there's still an element of some things never change. Yep. Or if it does change, it takes a very long time. So absolutely, the rebound post-COVID has, has helped the domestic economy this year. And with the dramatically aging workforce, the labor market is tight. I know we talk about this all the time here in, in the US, but it is absolutely true in, in Japan. And you think about with 20% of the workforce retiring over the next 20 years, just how much 
more impactful wage inflation could be. All of that then leads, of course, to yield curve control being hard to maintain and has interesting implications for the domestic economy, particularly banks, and also, of course, the, the yen, which for a US dollar investor is, is critical too. But that aging population is not unequivocally positive. There are various studies on what retiring in Japan means to consumption, and they range from neutral to slightly negative. So I think there's a, there's a risk there that actually we're still overestimating what Japan domestic growth will be. And of course, it's, it's low quality companies. Yeah. We can see in low, with lower ROEs in Japan versus Europe or the US, not just because of poor capital allocation, but because of lower net interest, sorry, lower net profit margins. That's something which is much more fundamentally difficult to solve. And that's where it it really does come down to, in some ways, do we believe in the corporate governance improvement? Yeah. Because if you believe that, if we take the margin point for, for a second, if you believe that Japan will no longer focus on trying to employ as many people as possible and keeping businesses running, even if they're mildly loss-making simply because they don't want to fire people, if you believe that their cultural aversion to, to M&A means that so many of these businesses, which quite frankly in the US wouldn't exist today, that have been swallowed up and seen dramatic cost cuts, if you believe all of that changes, then there's some potential for margins to rise, not to the levels that you see in, in the US, of course, but some potential. And then you have to believe that the net cash on the balance sheets gets spent. Maybe it's dividends, maybe it's buybacks, maybe it's for the first time in a long time investing in, in innovation. Yep. But I have to confess I'm, I'm skeptical. I think that even the more optimistic people on corporate governance reform in Japan right now would say, would point to slightly higher net dividend and buyback yields. I would point to the fact that they're actually not that much higher than other moments we've seen in the past. We've seen different reforms from Japan to and tended to, to drive corporate governance change. Yep. And we still haven't seen that. And people have got very excited this year about the Tokyo Stock Exchange threat to delist companies that continue to, uh, to trade below book value. You've got to remember that the majority of companies that trade below book value on the, the topics are actually tiny, tiny companies, which you could delist and no one would know. If you think they're delisting a Honda because they're trading at below book value, then unfortunately, you're very much mistaken. So forgive me for the skepticism, but when it comes to corporate governance reform in, in Japan, I need to see the proof before I, I believe it. And even then, even when you look at the autos companies, the banks in Japan, the governance improvements they could make, the better allocation of capital, they still don't generate returns which are good enough to justify meaning, meaningfully high valuations. And I see all of this with the backdrop of Japan's been the best performing equity market in local right. currency this year. Right. So expectations have, have risen quite dramatically too. And ultimately for me, I, I think there is a short-term opportunity. I do think if, if rates rise, then certainly domestic-focused businesses can do well. The depreciation of the yen so far has helped margins and exporters, but of course, for everyone arguing that the yen is cheap, they have to remember that that hits the earnings of Japan's best companies if, uh, if the yen were to rally. So all in all, pick your opportunities carefully, but I think a structural overweight to Japan at this point is, is far from proven. What I'm hearing you say is that it's really about the lack of dynamism. Right, and that's best reflected through the margin and the profitability. Like, if if the companies looked more like some of the big tech names in the U.S. or some of the names that you mentioned out of Europe, maybe there would be a reason to be more excited from an investment perspective. But if I'm hearing you correctly, this is more of a trade than anything else. In your in your view, in my view, it's more of a trade. And and when you think about that innovation, that dynamism, of course, that manifests itself in in top line growth. And you look at our long term capital market assumptions. Yep. Japan's top line growth lags the US, it, it lags Europe. It's quite frankly not very compelling. And it's because the biggest part of Japan's equity indices are autos, where Toyota used to be seen as the darling of the sector because they had hybrids. Right. Well, now they're lagging far behind the Chinese on, on electric vehicles. You think about the banks where even if they were to, to get higher rates, you're still not going to get very good returns from them. And you think about the cross shareholdings that they have. There's just too much that has Japan getting in its own way and not enough that really leads to, to growing markets. And without growth, you cost cut your way to nothing. Yep. And I mean, there's also an angle where that economy has had a foundation of, of zero rates for how many decades? I mean, what do we really know about the other side of the mountain? If they are able to break away from a zero rate and a yield curve control environment, I imagine it could be a little bit bumpy 
uh, on the uh, on the way back down. I would think so. And there's, there's so many dynamics to that. You think about if there is inflation, well, Japan's pension system is designed to give right. pensioners less of a step up in, in their pension than, than inflation. So that will be challenging. If you think to ultimately about what higher rates would mean for, for government debt, if rates in Japan went to 2%, then suddenly government debt payments are 6% of, right. of GDP. That's a huge number, and that's a problem. I just think it's it's too premature to get excited about Japan, particularly given valuations just aren't that cheap anymore. Yep. No, all, all very good points. And so I um, want to bring what has been an excellent conversation kind of to a close. You, you kind of gave both the bull and the bear case for Japan. Um, I want to circle back to Europe for a second. You, know, you, you certainly painted... Europe and the UK in, in a relatively positive light, um, what would make you less constructive on the opportunity set across the pond? But the challenge Europe has always had is, is it is less self-sufficient self from an energy perspective. It has a more nuanced, shall we say, government structure. It tends to over-regulate itself and, and really get in its own way. And those things haven't changed. And at certain moments, though, they rear their, their heads. If we do have escalation of the, what, the awful issues going on in, in Israel and the Middle East, then what does that mean for energy policy? We saw what happened with Russia and Ukraine and how disruptive that was. Well, there are, there are risks there. I do think, though, despite these risks, valuations are telling you that the market understands that. And I think just to finish on a positive note for, for Europe versus versus the US, we talked about higher cost of capital, but there's one yeah. dynamic of that I don't think we have touched on, which is I, I mentioned the US, we see earnings growth of over 9%, Europe is about five and a half. I don't know that anyone fully understands yet in a higher cost of capital world what that means for top line growth. Right. The US, of course, has grown significantly faster, but how much of that was an era of, of free money? Right. It's not all that, of course not, but if you see a narrowing of that growth gap between the US and Europe at a point where European valuations are just so low, I think that there's a really compelling argument to, I would argue, be overweight Europe. At the very least, make sure you have some exposure. Well, as always, it sounds like we should, uh, we should focus on the fundamentals. So Tim, this has been fantastic. Thank you for joining me for the first video edition of Center for Investment Excellence. And uh, more than anything, I'm looking forward to having you back sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today on J.P. Morgan Center for Investment Excellence. If you found our insights useful, you can find more episodes anywhere you listen to podcasts, on our website, and on our J.P. Morgan Asset Management YouTube channel, recorded on November 7th, 2023. This content is intended for information only based on assumptions in current market conditions and are subject to change. No warranty of accuracy is given. This content does not contain sufficient information to support investment decisions. It is not to be construed as research, legal, regulatory, tax, accounting, or investment advice. Investments involve risks. Investors should seek professional advice or make an independent evaluation before investing. The value of investments and the income from them may fluctuate, including loss of capital. Past performance and yield are not indicative of current or future results. Forecasts and estimates may or may not come to pass. J.P. Morgan Asset Management is the asset management business of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company and its affiliates worldwide.